Apple Silicon Macs are coming. By the end of the year, they'll be here and my iPad should be scared. Hey, I'm Jerry and to the possible detriment of my iPad Pro with Magic Keyboard, new Macs with Apple Silicon are coming. It is possible that the features an Apple Silicon MacBook could offer will make it more compelling to use on the couch or when mobile, reducing the appeal of my iPad. Eek. I love my 12.9 inch iPad Pro and Magic Keyboard. Together, they provide me with what I need 95% of the time when I'm using a device. It is my go-to couch and quick trip device because it does so many things so well. Because the iPad is a tablet touch first device, it doubles as a two-in-one where you can just remove the iPad from the keyboard to play a game, surf the web, or flick through Twitter. And when I need to work on a video script or do my real actual day job, I just slap this thing on the Magic Keyboard and I'm all set up with a trackpad and a keyboard that I can use to remote into corporate servers or workstations or crank out some emails. The Apple A12X processor that is in this thing is almost two years old and it still blows away the performance of similarly priced laptops. Heck, the single core performance is the same as my new 2020 mid-range iMac, but the iPad is in such a compact package rarely gets warm to the touch and doesn't have a fan. There are so many great things about the iPad Pro with Magic Keyboard that make it functional and fun to use. However, there are a few instances still where I need to move to a full Mac or PC desktop experience. Safari on iPad OS 14 was upgraded to a full desktop browser, but that's not exactly accurate. It does display web pages by default in a desktop mode, but because it's still a mobile browser underneath, there are still times where a web page just does not work correctly. Some examples of this would be things like government websites or forms that have not been upgraded for modern devices. Things like Google Docs have been improved, but if you go to a website that incorporates maps of some kind, whether it's Google or Apple, you can't use the mouse and keyboard to zoom in. So things like that. As I get more into this whole YouTube thing, the way I create thumbnails keeps evolving. When I first started, I was using Canva to help design my thumbs, and as I get better at this, I have moved over to Photoshop, which now has an iPad app. Not all of the tools have been ported yet from the desktop to the iPad, and things work a little bit differently. So for now, my muscle memory just pushes me towards the iMac to try and knock them out faster. I love video editing on this iPad using LumaFusion because it's fast and intuitive and I could just quickly go through and create jump cuts. Some of my videos are shot with multiple cameras at the same time, and to splice them together so I can quickly cut from camera A to camera B, I need a desktop editor like Final Cut Pro or Premiere Pro. They make it very simple to synchronize multiple clips and just use the keyboard as I'm playing through the clips to you know, jump between camera A and camera B and make cuts easily. And whether I'm editing a video or remote it into a work server, Sometimes I just need more screen real estate. Although you can connect the iPad to an external display, it just mirrors it and does not give you any more space to work with or extend beyond a single display. I can think of a few more reasons when I actually need a desktop OS as limited in number as they actually are, but that is why my iPad should be scared. When Apple announced that Apple Silicon Macs were coming, they talked about reaching the power of a desktop with the power consumption of a laptop. Like I said earlier, the iPad Pro from 2018 is as fast in single core performance as my 2020 mid-range iMac. If you took the same A12X chip and put it in a bigger base with better thermal capacity, I'm certain that the performance would be even better. And just think, Apple's not going to throw an A12X from 2018 into its new laptops. If you watch Luke Miani's video, with his predictions of the A14X processor, he does a great job of breaking down the history of Apple A-series processors. Luke goes over the performance differences between the A and the AX chips and discerns based on the averages that the A14X could be faster than the i9 in the latest 16-inch MacBook Pro and just shy of the i9 iMac, which if somewhat accurate would be amazing. And depending on which product you're talking about, Apple could have much bigger chips with more cores, more room for thermal limits, and even maybe multiple chips. <sighs> A guy can dream. 
All right, back to the MacBooks that could actually compete with this iPad Pro. So in the context of an A14X type processor in a MacBook or MacBook Air sized laptop, one could expect that the laptop would not get hot like the current Air does. The current Air with either an i5 or i7 can get uncomfortably hot just doing basic things. Then God forbid if you wanna play an Apple arcade game or even Minecraft, you almost can't hear the game from the speakers over the super loud fans. It's possible we could get killer performance without the need for a fan. So super high performance chip that is very power conservative and doesn't require a fan with a larger chassis could lead to battery life that is beyond what anyone thought. iPads, since the very first generation, have been given battery estimates of around 10 hours of use. MacBooks get what Apple calls now all day battery life, which actually ends up being somewhere around four to six hours. So with low power needs and a bigger chassis, I could see a situation where these laptops can get 12 to 18 hours of battery life. I don't wanna go into graphics chips too much because I'm not a gamer and I don't really pay that much attention to them. But Apple did show off the A12X running Final Cut Pro with graphics intensive changes on the fly. We also know how good many of the games are on iPad and iPhone, so it can be assumed that the graphics performance on these new Apple Silicon chips will be above average and there's even rumors of Apple developing their own discrete graphics cards, which I think could be really pushing the boundaries of what we know today. One advantage that the iPad has over the Mac is a touchscreen. We have all heard Apple's arguments against touchscreens on the Mac for the last 10 years, but times are changing. So many Windows laptops have included touchscreens and so many kids are growing up in a touch first world that I think Apple is looking at adding touchscreens to the Mac in the future. I'm not saying that touchscreens are always good or good for everything, but sometimes just based on what you're doing, it is simpler to just reach up and swipe on the screen instead of using a mouse or trackpad. And if you want to see potential evidence of touchability coming to the Mac, look at the demos of macOS Big Sur. The control center has horizontal sliders for changing things like volume and brightness, which look very much like they are being built for touch. Then you add in Apple Pencil support and, huh, I think some people want it. In some cases, touch on the Mac would be useful and it's almost inevitable at this point. The only question is when? And the last thing that I think is coming to the Mac with Apple Silicon, cellular connectivity. Finally, we will be able to buy a Mac, slap a SIM card in it, and have internet connectivity, connect, connecti connectivity anywhere and anytime. I use the cellular data in my iPad all the time. I love it. I like the convenience of it always being on and not having to find and connect to a Wi-Fi network. I think they are more secure than any public Wi-Fi and I don't need to agree to any BS terms or restrictions compared to say a hotel Wi-Fi connection. So. If you take a Mac that can run all of the desktop software you need without restrictions, add in all the benefits of an iPad, like performance, low heat, battery life, touchscreen, and cellular connectivity, what you are left with is almost a no compromise portable computing experience. Sure, you may not be able to remove the screen from the keyboard, but for me, it's such a limited use case. If only half of what I just talked about is accurate, then my iPad should be shaking in its boots because I'm not sure I can resist such a full featured device with so many benefits. If you disagree and you love the iPad for exactly what it is, and you're just looking for ways to make it feel a little bit more like a laptop, you should check out this video right over here. If you like this video, hit the thumbs up button and subscribe for videos on all the cool new things that are coming out this fall. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.